to John Abraham, Ritwik Ghatak and Andre Tarkovsky. Hallowed names in film schools across India. The slogan was one used by the students of the Film and Television Institute of India in a famous strike in 2015. In our first episode, we saw Ghatak, Abraham and Kamal Swaroop amongst others take to the streets in unusual ways. We encountered the figure of Rana Tigrina in Swaroop's Om Darbadar that referred to an amphibian creature who can live on land and water. The film's hero Om would himself soon become one such creature and even Om Darbadar itself would turn ubiquitous disappearing into the celluloid ether even as it reappeared in digital amorphousness all around us I am Ashish Rajadyaksha over this episode I will also be Mahatma Gandhi SK Patil K Shankar Appa and the honorable attorney general and Lekha Naidu will be Miss Ida Dickinson Our voices have been cloned using AI tools in explicit invocation to a major legal judgment that expresses a fear that the morphing of, of images, images change of voices and many other technologically advanced, advanced methods could create serious potential social disorder and that we have all now turned into publishers printers producers directors and broadcasters we start this episode with another strange fantasy image not as radical perhaps as ghatak's bhabo bhabo baba practice karo or practice thinking or om darbadas rana tigrina but worth a mention chapter 1 a satyajit ray plastic bangle सलमान खान सुपर स्टार रजनी कांत गुरुदत्त कमाल अमरोही सत्यजीत राय sequence in Pan Nalin's 2021 film Chelo Show. It tells of a young boy who has fallen in love with the movies. He watches them compulsively inside the projection booth of an old and ramshackle movie theater having bribed the projectionist. The boy is mesmerized by the intoxicating sound and feel of old celluloid. When times change and the ancient movie theater is brought down and replaced by digital projection, this boy, his name is Same follows hundreds of trunks of now obsolete celluloid cans to the junkyard where he sees them being reduced to plastic from which many things are made including colorful plastic bangles made and sold on the streets as he sees women in colorful dress and bangles everywhere he starts to imagine what bangles might have been made from discarded satyajit ray prints what a gurudas bangle might look like and what came from a salman khan film Chapter 2 The Film Age
like the plastic bangles like rana tigrina like much of modern architecture like film songs blaring from street corners the audio visual every day of an indian city is permeated by the movies cinema in india and perhaps everywhere has been all around us haunting our every day the cinema has never been limited to the movie theater such a spillover has been a source as much of hope of cinephiliac pleasure as it has been a source of worry and concern art historians have often positioned cinema in this larger sense as defining the experience of modernity itself Arnold Hauser famously ends his monumental social history of art with what he calls the age of film. The 20th century began late, he says. It came to be only by the 1920s when the end of the First World War coincided with the cinema taking root as an industry. The age of film was also a time of what he calls mass democracy, mass society, where the broad masses can have a share in political life. It is also as a result the age whose ruling philosophy views the revolt of the masses to be single-handedly responsible for the alienation and degradation of modern culture. Mass democracy has never been easy to achieve. It has been a battle on the street, in courtrooms and in movie theaters. It would often be a battle over a definable entity named film, an entity that could have a title, a name, a censor certificate versus an increasingly amorphous undefinable unquantifiable and eventually uncensorable moving image in 1928 soon after the age of film took root in india an indian cinematograph committee trying to understand the social impact of the cinema upon a continent of unlettered masses quoted a confident assertion by something called a bombay vigilance association led by a miss ida m dickinson and a mr m j antia constant appeasement with pictures showing men and women in close contact or suggesting sexual relations can have a debasing influence on the spectators and particularly affect young men and women just as the liquor shop is the closest ally of the brothel so the cinema may become an equally potent medium of incitement to illicit sexual intercourse films depicting acts of criminality cannot fail to have an injurious effect upon impressionable minds scenes depicting clever escapes disguises outwitting detectives assaulting policemen breaking open safes etc may gradually lead to awakening of the control exercised by the respect in which the law ought to be held by the people in december 1947 Mahatma Gandhi made one of his few pronouncements on cinema when speaking to the panchayat of the town of Sambal in Uttar Pradesh. Your village should be free of dirt and dung in every way and it should be free, free from, from foul smells. You should follow the rules of sanitation. Why do you need a cinema here? Instead of this You can perform the various plays and stage dramas known to us. The cinema will only make you spend money. Then you will also learn to gamble and, and fall into other evil habits. Chapter 3 Cleaning up the cinema. In 1951, soon after independence, a film inquiry committee chaired by S.K. Patil was set up by the newly independent India. It issued several dire warnings that were not only to do with the moral illegitimacy of cinema, but also its financial illegitimacy. Such is the glamour of quick and substantial returns which a comparatively small number of producers can secure as a result of the success of their productions. that the industry has shown no signs of suffering from lack of new entrepreneurs who are prepared to gamble for high stakes often at the cost to boot the taste of the public and the prosperity of the industry in the process many of them lose their own private fortunes in a substantial measure make the general public pay to see pictures which not only discredit their intelligence but also enhance their reputation for credulity and submission to make believe In 1952, 2 years after India became a republic, 
the Indian Cinematograph Act was passed and it brought moral policing together with the need for financial reform. This act went alongside a plan to set up numerous institutions meant both to subsidize and to clean up the Indian cinema, including a film finance corporation and a film censor board. The cleanup of the cinema defined what we might now call a cleanup of the right to the cinema in two contradictory directions. One, defined by Article 15 of the Constitution of India, saw the movie theatre as a key institution of the modern public sphere, where you could buy a ticket and enter regardless of your class, gender, caste or religion. The second, defined by Article 19, where the right to freedom of speech came to mean the filmmaker's speech. I asked the legal scholar Lawrence Liang how the contradictory tensions played out in the cinema. The problem is only growing as an expanded cinema takes root. There are a whole range of questions that you know that you've asked here, which is Article 15 of the Constitution, which is a non-discrimination provision, and Article 15 says that you know no citizen will be, you know, prohibited entry to various kinds of public spaces, shops, public restaurants, including public entertainment, spaces of public entertainment. And your question is whether there's a paradoxical or a kind of a contradictory pull between the authorial rights embedded in Article 19 and the spectatorial rights in a spatial sense in Article 15 and provisions of the Cinematograph Act. How do we address this question of what constitutes a right to cinema beyond, let's say, the authorial argument Unfortunately, we don't actually have too many cases from a constitutional perspective on what Article 15 and access to places of public entertainment are and in relation to cinema. We don't actually have too many cases on that. What we have a lot of is cases that emerge from the Cinematograph Act, which is about the regulatory powers of the state in relation to the spatial dimension of cinema. This would soon change as a new era emerged, initially with video, as the cinema now went literally beyond the movie theatre, exploding the spectator's spatial right to cinema. Liang again. The video moment is really the one that opens up this question, because what happens with the emergence of video in India are video libraries and video parlours. A large number of the video parlours that emerge in the 80s, emerge in the context of restaurants, hotels, which basically became ad hoc movie theatres. And the question for the courts were twofold. One is whether video is cinematograph for the purposes of the Cinematograph Act. And the second is whether a restaurant that shows a movie using a television and a video cassette recorder becomes a cinema hall in the classical sense of the term, right? And these are, were really interesting because you have a whole bunch of cases and the names of the cases themselves are quite fascinating. So you'll have Restaurant Lee versus State of Madhya Pradesh, or you'd have like, you know, Bobby Cafe versus State of Punjab, whatever, you know, just as a uh, representative example. The right to the cinema now splits into a growing chasm as the spectator's right to the cinematic space extended further to a right to the image coming increasingly into conflict with the right of the filmmaker's speech. Invariably, there will be clashes. So if piracy, for example, is a way of actualizing the right to cinema, which is that it gives access for a large number of people to the cinematic image, it appears to be in clash with or in, in, in kind of, you know, in, in conflict with the authorial right that's embedded in Article 19. In 1990, a relatively unknown Kannada filmmaker named K. M. Shankarappa took the Indian state to court. In a petition filed in the Karnataka High Court, he argued that the Indian parliament was not qualified to have passed the Cinematograph Act in the first place. Like Khwaja Ahmad Abbas had done two decades earlier, Shankarappa mounted his arguments essentially on a freedom of speech platform. But he cast the concept very wide. He claimed, that parliament was not competent to pass the act, that sections 3, 4 and 5D of the act do not contain the guidelines, inasmuch as no qualifications are prescribed for the members of the board and the affluent tribunal, that section 7 of the act, insofar as it imposes the penalty, is also unconstitutional 
as it suffers from the vice of Article 14 of the Constitution. Lastly, it is contended that Section 6 of the Act, insofar as it empowers the central government to exercise the power of revision against the order passed by the tribunal, is bad in law. Such a position, defending the right to speech, has dominated censorship debate well into the present. Here is the filmmaker Alankrita Srivastava responding to the threat to ban her film Lipstick Under My Burka, a threat she feels was posed by the film's overtly feminist content. So the only thing that I can make of this whole thing is that uh, the CBSC is somehow very threatened by a film that is very clearly feminist at its core and uh, is really made from a female perspective and it is about the ordinary lives of four ordinary women and uh, about their dreams and uh, their desires and them exploring the idea of having agency over their own lives. And here is the filmmaker Amol Palekar taking the censor board to court once again in 2017. Nobody bothers to go beyond that and go to the basics, basics, constitutional validity of censorship. And that's what we have tried to do. Try to question, try to have a re-look at the Cinematography Act, try to have a look at the CBFC and how it functions, etc. Et Unlike Abbas, most of Shankarappa's arguments didn't get by. The High Court was able to read them down, reduce them to procedural issues and dispose of them. Only one argument hit home and it did so for interesting reasons. This was his challenge to the clause that allowed the central government to bypass its own censor board and its own appellate tribunal and make any order as it thinks fit for a previously censored film, which meant, for example, banning a film that the censors had passed. Official, unofficial, phone, pe, wireless, se, Wi-Fi, se, kahin se koi communication hai. I need some communication from somebody saying that you know, such and such portion is not acceptable to us. So there's no such thing. In our Hindu, we say, I'm not going to be a good person. कि यदि ऐसा होता तो कैसा होता ऐसी अगर बात है तो अब सबका मान सम्मान रखते हुए अगर जब मुझे कोई कम्युनिकेशन कहीं से भी मिलेगा तो मैं रिस्पॉन्ड करूंगा मैं इंतजार कर रहा हूं आर आर पाटिल साहब के in 2011, yet another challenge to the unilateral right that the old cinematograph act gave to the Indian state to overrule the censor board came from another filmmaker. Prakash Jha questioned the sheer validity of the Cinematograph Act. Yadi aisa hota to kaisa hota? Jha too was arguing along the lines of free speech, but he however added another issue, that of public order. Jha's mega-budget film Arakshan was deemed by the National Commission for Scheduled Castes and Scheduled Tribes to be casteist and potentially anti-Dalit. Mayawati first banned the film in Uttar Pradesh, followed by the Punjab and Andhra Pradesh governments, Punjab further claiming without substantiation that they had intelligence reports that the movie had certain scenes and dialogues which may upset some communities in the state. You surely couldn't withdraw an already censored film and claim that it presents a threat to law and order even before the film has been released, he argued, on the grounds of yadi aisa hota to kaisa hota. Surely the film had to first enter the public domain before you decided that it could pose such a problem. The film uh, censor has approved it. तो सेंसर के भी तो कोई मानता है कि नहीं है नहीं तो हम कल को सेंसर जाना बंद कर दें फिर हम फिल्म बनाने के बाद में अखबार में एडवर्टाइजमेंट दे दें दिस वाज एन इंपॉर्टेंट आर्ग्युमेंट सिंस इट इवोक सम रादर डिफरेंट लीगल प्रोविजंस दैट द सेंसर बोर्ड हैड लॉज दैट आर्ग्युड फॉर द राइट टू टेक प्रिवेंटिव एक्शन एंड टू अवॉइड फ्यूचर इंसाइटमेंट टू द कमिशन ऑफ अ कॉग्निसिबल थ्रेट टू पब्लिक ऑर्डर Chapter 4 Making Cinema Elusive A new era in the history of disruption arose in 1972 when a performance of Vijay Tendulkar's play Sakharam Binder was closed down by a group of between 7 and 10 men 
at Pune's Bal Gandharva Rangamandir Theatre. The disruptors claimed to be ordinary members of civil society who had been offended by the play's alleged amorality, although it was an open secret that the Shiv Sena was probably behind the attack. Plays by Vijay Tendulkar became, as the years went on, a significant target for attack. Some years later, reflecting on these events, Tendulkar said that there was nothing easier to interrupt than a play being staged. कर पर गुंता गुंती से सोता सगा माझा अनुभव सगळा कॉन्ट्रोवर्सीज नाटकांचा सोड सगळा कॉन्ट्रोवर्सीचा असा आहे माय एक्सपीरियन्स विथ ऑल दीस कॉन्ट्रोवर्सीज लिवल ऑन माय प्लेस प्लेस बाय अदर्स टू हैज बीन दैट द वर्क दैट इज सीन एज हैविंग स्टार्टेड द कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी दैट इज ओनली एन एक्सक्यूज एंड दोस हु एंटर एंड मेक यूज ऑफ दीस प्लेस दे हैव नो आईडिया व्हाट्स इन देम टेक एनी कॉन्ट्रोवर्सी अबाउट एनी वर्क ऑफ आर्ट that controversy has never been created by that play that film or that work the need for the controversy lies elsewhere than in the work some people become instrumentalized by that external need and then they close down the play there is nothing easier than shutting down a performance of a play you shut down the play and the next day your name and photograph comes in the newspapers this will always be there as long as there are plays there will always be someone out there who will want to shut it down This is what's happening for both these plays. It is true that some audiences found these plays disturbing, but they were not the ones who closed them down. The first show play, and it came on the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, the seventh day, the eighth day, the ninth day, the tenth day. You only need to tell the performers not to do this or else, and almost without exception, you would succeed. They were, said Tendulkar, simply too vulnerable. This was true not only of theatre. Tendulkar suggests that such attacks can happen to anything material, anything bound by time and place. Performances in infrastructure heavy auditoria were static in the way that they were authored, starred, named, dated and located. Such performances were entirely reliant on the support of a hierarchical structure of authority. It was rarely the audiences that caused the problems at Tendulkar, disturbed as they might have been. The disruption was always by others. initiated by people who picked such events up only because the venues were so completely fragile the personnel so utterly vulnerable chapter 5 a lightweight cinema main tumhe aur bhi khoobsurat bana deta hu haath choda mera tumhara permanent makeup kar deta hu teja se हमने कुछ नहीं देखा हमने कुछ नहीं देखा हमने कुछ नहीं देखा द वेरी फर्स्ट आर्ट फॉर्म दैट वुड लिटरली टेक टू द स्ट्रीट्स वाज स्ट्रीट थिएटर टेकिंग थिएटर टू द स्ट्रीट्स हैज अ लॉन्ग हिस्ट्री दैट वेंट बैक टू द 1940s से सुदनवा देशपांडे ऑफ द जन नाट्य मंच हाउएवर द श्रिंकिंग पब्लिक डोमेन इज लीडिंग टू सम सिग्निफिकेंट एस्थेटिक चैलेंजेस for such theater the earliest history of street theater in india modern street theater uh, is really something that goes back to the 1940s and at that time street theater was really in a sense uh, proscenium theater done outside of the proscenium arch outside of an auditorium so it kind of mimicked the stage play it's just that it did it in the open it's only in the 19 late 1970s that street theater starts to take the form that we now recognize it as which is a theater in the round and it's theater that's done without any uh, props or very you know very minimal props no you know no makeup uh, very minimal uh, you know costumes and so on it starts to develop its own drama and that's also something that constantly uh, evolves so in cities for instance today in delhi we find it awfully hard to find spaces in bastis where you can perform in the round because you know spaces have been encroached upon a lot uh, in other words there are no open spaces that are available for people everything is is encroached upon by the state and by corporate and so for people just to be able to enjoy an open space and to enjoy a performance in an open space has become more and more and more difficult so you have to often perform in little gullies which means that you have audiences on two sides not on four sides etc etc so so you know that keeps changing all the time the turn in performance then from the static to the mobile from the scheduled to the unscheduled from formal to informal and from heavy infrastructure to none at all 
eventually from the known to the anonymous, from named film director to hacker, signified a larger millennial transformation of the public political event itself, from organized morchas to spontaneous hits, and from occupy protests to completely fluid movements, to be water, as the 2019 Hong Kong protests described it. Across the 1990s and early 2000s, the fluid protest was in large measure a response to the growing dangers of a shrinking public sphere that offered few of the historical guarantees of public safety. I think there is uh, what can be called censorship of the state and there is something that we can call censorship of the street. Now, censorship of the state is very hard to, to implement as far as street theatre is concerned because street theatre, by its very nature, uh, is something that is very mobile, flexible, it's hard to determine when exactly it's going to happen, uh, where it's going to happen and so on. As a result, since you're not booking an auditorium, there's not necessarily a time and space that's announced in advance for a street play. It can, uh, it can be awfully hard to, uh, to censor street theatre. Also because it's hard to kind of get uh, scripts that are published uh, and so on. Uh, scripts also uh, are amenable to improvisation, change on the spot, etc, etc. What forms does censorship of the street take? Deshpande goes on. They take all kinds of forms. It could be a neighborhood cop who turns up at a, at a show and says, you know, do you have permission for this and so on. It could be that the state passes, uh, that, uh, that the government might pass an order saying that section 144 has been, has been implemented in certain parts of the city and so on. So, so that's at the, at the milder end of the spectrum. Then you could have the local, you know, the sort of the local RSS uh, uncle um, who might turn up at a show and start saying, nahi, nahi, ye to bahut galat hai. you know, what you're doing is anti-Hindu or anti-this or anti-that and so on. Or it could be a more concerted physical attack. Um, and so therefore, there's a whole range of things that start to happen, a whole range of attacks, a whole range of ways in which uh, different forces, state as well as non-state, try to uh, uh, try to curtail the right of citizens to speak up. To the filmmaker Nakul Singh Sohani, known for his documentary film Muzaffar Nagar Baki Hai, the shift occurred after 2002 when the political events in Gujarat saw numerous filmmakers pick up lightweight cameras to shoot the events taking place on the ground. And I remember when the Gujarat massacre happened and then, you know, a lot of documentaries were being screened in the university at that time. <laughs> on some on gender justice and, on, and a whole range of issues. The Gujarat, the 2002 massacre had just happened and I remember some films that were released around then, you know, Gopal Menon's Hey Ram and <laughs> just the fact that Gopal's was the first, I think, the first major film on uh, this issue to have released and it had a massive impact. I mean, it, I think we realized, I, I personally realized how the sort of the documentary image can be so powerful. In the the idea of people talking, you know, so that, that documentary image and, and, and how that frame of the documentary, uh, of course, I mean, you still have to make a good film, <laughs> right? But and like you have to make a good play, you know, mm -hmm. so. But I think that frame of the documentary is so powerful. It tells a story in a way that no other form of cinema does, which is not to undermine the other forms of cinema. In several of Nakul Singh Sawney's films, there is the reference to street theatre. For example, his documentary title Izzat Nagar Ki Asabya Betiya, made in 2012, on young women, honour killings and Western UP's notorious Khap Panchayats, centrally features the street play Dhodi Ke Par. Sony himself did street theatre when studying at Delhi's Kirodimal College and makes the connection directly. There is something very basic and raw and bare bones. Of, and, and I think the connect it makes with the audience is, is vastly different from, say, the way proscenium or even feature films connect or fiction connects. Chapter 6 Prior Restraint In the year 2000, introducing a new era of cyber law in India, the Information Technology Act was passed. Prior restraint, through banning or incarceration, has, we have seen, always been a part of censorship 
but now it took a further turn as prior restraint shaded into the grimmer domain of preventive detention. One of the provisions of the IT Act, Section 66A, uses the reasonable restriction to free speech doctrine to make it a punishable offence for any person to send offensive or false information using a computer or any electronic device. Another, 69A, allowed governments to issue content blocking orders to online intermediaries such as internet service providers, web hosting services, search engines or social media platforms if the information is deemed a threat to India's national security, sovereignty or public order. In 2015, a second-year law student, Shreya Singhal, challenged the Information Technology Act as once again a violation of free speech, as Lawrence Liang explains. The importance of the Shreya Singhal judgment, if one had to evaluate it after seven years, are a couple of things. One was that we have to remember that this is a judgment that actually struck down a provision of law, a statute, or a provision in a statute on the grounds of Article 191A. That hadn't happened in a very long time. And that it did so by introducing, in a way, a kind of a jurisprudential category. It it made a distinction uh, between three layers in which one could understand expression. So Nariman's uh, distinction between mere opinion, advocacy, and incitement is a relatively new addition in a way to the jurisprudence of free speech. It also has a fourth category that hasn't really been used, but an important one nonetheless, which is recognizing the fact that certain provisions may have a chilling effect on freedom of speech and expression. So in terms of a judgment that was viewed from the perspective of freedom of speech and expression, a very significant one, there are of course larger issues involved in terms of how it imagines the internet, et cetera. And some of these questions are the ones which haven't been focused on so much uh, because it's primarily read only from the perspective of what it does for Article 191A. Stating the government's position on why these draconian laws were needed, the Attorney General made arguments that were remarkably similar to the fears of cinema we had seen a century ago, now extended to the internet. So obscenity would be an offence by way of morality. Whereas if you look at the idea of public order or any of the other kind of exceptions in 192 in the interest of sovereignty, integrity, security of the state, etc. They deal with the conception of a graded movement from a general fracas as public order to the ultimate idea of the overthrow of the state. Uh, But that logic is not necessarily what distinguishes the interpretation of 66A and 69. The argument here is that if 66A was struck down on the grounds of content, it was struck down on the grounds that the idea of annoyance is a category that's actually beyond the scope of Article 19.2. So the rule is very clear that if there is any speech restricting provision, it has to be brought either explicitly in terms of the language within Article 19.2, so the words public order should be there, or it should be conceptually brought within the ambit of Article 19.2. And in this case, they said that the problem with the specific language of 66A, including the words annoyance, etc., were that they fell foul of Article 19.2 because they were vague. In contrast, 69A, which is not so much about You know, um, 69A is not based in a way on a subjective perception alone, which is someone can claim uh, annoyance or that they were were annoyed and hence they can bring, you know, uh, the, the, the law into motion. As much as the requirement of a set of state actions that had to be satisfied for blocking an entire website. In the Shreya Single Judgment, Nariman basically says that if you look at 69A, it's a lot more circumscribed. It's circumscribed by procedure and it's also circumscribed by substance. Both of which the problem of vagueness in the case of annoyance, it was not circumscribed. And I would say that that's the distinction that allows him to save 69A. Otherwise, you know, to make an argument that there's a distinction 
uh, between cinema that pertain to a pre-public order conception and cinema that pertain to a post-public order conception, I don't think that's entirely accurate. If you look at the, again, the historical, um, you know, debates that took place around cinema, there are two dimensions to it. There is the spatial dimension and there's the content dimension. And right from its inception in terms of the history of cinematic regulation, the two were brought together. And eventually with the passing of the Cinematograph Act, the two were actually brought together in, in a single place. There was always the fear of the congregation of crowds and the, you know, kind of coming together in a public place and being incited or being excited by what they saw on the screen, which would then spill over back into the space or get enfolded back into public spaces. So I think there's a there's a there's actually a longer history that ties the two together. Uh, and in Shreya Singhal, there is a separation that happens, but I don't think the separation on that count follows the same logic as you know the legal history of cinema. As he made his case for retaining the censorship provisions of the Information Technology Act, the State Attorney General Tushar Mehta presented a fevered description of the internet. It was as though cinema on speed. Mr. Mehta's statements directly echoed those we have quoted earlier with Miss Ida Dickinson in 1928 as they echo every one of the old colonial anxieties of a cinema running riot in Indian hands. Unlike print or even old-fashioned celluloid, which could still be regulated, the internet had no state boundaries, he said. My lord, the reach of print media is restricted to one state or at the most one country. While the internet has no boundaries and its reach is global, the recipient of the free speech and expression used in a print media can only be literary persons. My internet can be accessed by literate and illiterate both, my lord, since one click is needed to download an objectionable post or a video. In case of television serials and movies, there is a permitted pre-censorship which ensures right of viewers not to receive any information which is dangerous or to not in conformity with the social interest. While in the case of an internet, no such pre-censorship is possible and each individual is publisher, printer, producer, director and broadcaster of the content without any statutory regulation, my lord. Morphing of images, change of voices, and many other technologically advanced methods to create serious potential social disorder can be applied. Rumors can be spread to trillions of people without check. It is easy, my lord, to invade upon the privacy of any individual. Unlike newspaper, magazine, television, or a movie, it is possible to sexually harass someone, outrage the modesty of anyone, use unacceptably filthy language, and evoke communal frenzy, which would lead to serious social disorder by a mere click of a button without any geographical limitations, and in almost all cases, while ensuring anonymity of the offender. A person will have to buy or borrow a newspaper and or will have to go to a theatre to watch a movie, my lord. For television also, one needs at least a room where a television is placed and can only watch those channels which he has subscribed. And that too, only at a time when it is being telecast. While in the case of an internet, a person abusing the internet can commit any offence at any place at the time of his choice and while maintaining his anonymity in all cases. Despite the panic, the Supreme Court nevertheless agreed with Shreya Singhal and struck down Section 66A. The judgment, however, maintained 69A which has led to the Indian state becoming the world's leader in issuing content blocking and takedown orders to digital intermediaries. Most important perhaps, it reproduced the old cinematic argument on intelligible differentia, saying that the internet was indeed a very different form of speech than anything else. The internet gives any individual a platform which requires very little or no payment through which to air his views, said the court. It agreed that something posted on a site or website travels like lightning and can reach millions of people all over the world. Separate offences needed to be created by legislation dedicated to the internet and to all digital content. 
In our third and final episode, we will look at what these separate offences might be as India entered a new era of political protest. The arrival of what came to be known worldwide as horizontalism or a form of protest often driven by social media platforms would take the cinema into a new era of the moving image of memes and forwards of uploading and circulation. It would lead to a new aesthetic challenge as the filmmaker turned into something else, a condition that most closely resembled something that would become a ubiquitous presence after 2000, namely the hacker. Cinema Strikes is brought to you by the Bangalore International Centre in collaboration with the Centre for the Study of Culture and Society. The podcast design, recording, supervision and assembly is by Gaurav Krishna and Ishan Gupta. Production by Raghu Tenkayala and Dekha Naidu and artwork by Chandini Venkatraman. Thanks as always to V. Ravichandar and the rest of the BIC team for everything. <laughs>